Thank you, Susan. Now we'll have uh, four Doolin disciples uh, talking about how they are living their call. First one up is Steve Gordon. And as Steve is coming up, he's, um, I asked him for like, uh, before we were joking around about his walk-up song. And his walk-up song is He Lives. And he wanted me to sing it, but you don't want me to do that. So, so Steve Gordon. Well, we'd have to talk to Mary about that because we'd really have to make it short given the distance from here to there, Alan. So, uh, so uh, but thank you for that introduction. My dear friend Walter Hilton has asked me today to share how I have sought to live out my calling in life and how I learned to do that. I must confess that I feel a bit awkward giving this talk because my story is hardly exceptional and likely is similar to most of your stories. As a cradle Christian, I've always known that my overarching calling in life is to honor God by responding to the needs of others when those needs present themselves. And as I used to tell my uh, early teen Sunday school students, I am capable of filling them, and this is a key point, at no unacceptable risk to myself. What I did not know in the early years of my life was the specific opportunities I would have as an adult to honor God by serving others. My, sp my first specific call as an adult came to me as I was working on my master's thesis way back in 1974 when dinosaurs roamed the earth. So, that's, <laughs> so um, this call framed how I would serve others throughout my career. The focus of my master's thesis, which one of my professors had suggested to me, was to assess the impact of a then recently enacted Mississippi state law that required each county in my home state to establish a central purchasing system. One day while I was engaged in the literature review for my thesis, it dawned on me that with the gifts and graces God had given me and with the assistance and support of others, I could contribute to how well governments at every level across the United States spend hard-earned taxpayer dollars to buy goods, services, and infrastructure. Although this may seem to the average person to be a strange area, or perhaps even a boring area for me to choose to honor God by serving other people, the average person likely does not know that total government purchases account for approximately 20% of our nation's gross domestic product. Nor does the average person grasp the importance of these purchases being planned, formed, and administered as well as possible. The multiple order consequences of the shortages of personal protective equipment, PPE as we came to call it, and other critical goods and services during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic support this, point, support this point well. People died, people lost loved ones, and people lost their businesses and jobs because in part, hardly any governments had set up their contracts for critical goods and services to withstand unprecedented and unanticipated shocks to supply chains. During the course of my long paid career in public procurement, in this arena of public procurement, in various positions in the nonprofit, higher education, governmental, and for profit sectors, I sought to fulfill my calling to contribute to how well governmental purchasing is done. Among other things, I found that receiving a salary and serving other people are not mutually exclusive. In addition, before and after retirement, I have sought out and benefited from opportunities to assist others as a volunteer in several areas of need. The people I have sought to serve through my volunteer work include those who struggle with mental health issues, loneliness, and developmental disabilities, and those who need to improve their English language skills. So how did I learn to live out my calling? The answer very simply is that I have learned from the examples and the encouragement of others whom I, whom I have been blessed to be surrounded by from my earliest days. These good people who were and are far too many to name here and now also provided me much needed counsel and constructive feedback that in some cases I did not welcome or appreciate at the time. And they opened doors for opportunities to serve that I would not have been able to open on my own. I thank God for the ability to join with you in honoring God by serving others.
Thank you, Steve. Uh, next up, we have uh, Nancy Roycher. Thanks. You didn't ask me what my walk-on song was going to be. Okay. No, it's okay. I don't, I don't need one. <laughs> yeah. um, I was actually really laughing about when Steve said um, that when dinosaurs roamed the earth, because I, honestly, and Walter and I had this conversation, when he said, I want to ask you to get up there and talk about your call. I'm like, my call is to be just a little weird and to make other people smile. And so I thought about wearing my dinosaur costume, um, but then I thought it's going to be awkward to put it on and y'all be like, what is she doing? So um, I, you know, I, I, I'm, true, I'm truly called to be silly and whimsical. And those of you who know me probably have seen my puppet collection and that was another thing that was going to happen. But I decided to try to take this a little seriously. So Walter, you know, this is me trying to be serious. So maybe I'm not called to that, but I'll try. Um, I think my calling in life is to help other people see their calling um, and get them excited about it. And it took me a while to figure this out because I always thought I should really do something hard and meaningful, maybe like nuclear engineering. Um, but I'm honestly, I'm not, I'm not called to be an engineer. <laughs> that would have been a bad decision. And instead, I'm, I'm drawn to facilitating meetings and doing team building and teaching leadership courses and building excitement in other people for learning new things. I got to do that in Sunday school here. I get to do it at work all the time. And it's really what I'm, I'm meant to do. And I, I learned how to do these things by doing them which was scary in the moment, but it turned out that's another thing I'm good at helping people do, is learn how to learn by doing. Um, and I learned in grad school that that's called experiential learning. So once things have a big fancy name, then it's probably worth doing, right? If someone else calls it something big and fancy, then it's good. And I also learned that I'm pretty good at listening to people to tease out what they love. So people sometimes say, I don't know, and I listen to them, I'm like, I hear it, I know what you want to do. So I can help them discover ways to do what they love, even while accomplishing something more annoying, like homework, or doing their self-assessment for the yearly performance evaluations, which is my current project. Um, my role is to help people uncover their strengths and plan for how to use them. And really, what could be more awesome than helping someone figure out what God calls them to do. It feels like a blessing to me. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, next up, we have uh, Bill Mosteller. Come on up, Bill. Good thing there's no walk-up music. I might have tripped on the way up. <laughs> I'm Bill Mosteller. Uh, I was born in Boston, and, but have lived in Northern Virginia for two-thirds of my life. My first point here is that it's all Sarah's fault. Uh, when I'd go visit her uh, out in Bellevue, Washington, she'd go to church, and I'd tag along. Uh, that got me uh, into the habit. Um, on both coasts. We'd identified and, uh, and focused on Doolin uh, when she was here one Christmas. Uh, in, in helping me prepare for this uh, talk, Walter uh, identified uh, the, the scripture just read. Uh, and my misunderstanding of that is press on. Uh, and that seems to me to be a theme here. Uh, I'm retired uh, and have been for a while. I wanted my retirement to be about something more than, than self-indulgence 24 by 7. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> uh, and church is a good place to participate in good works that are bigger than I can do uh, on my own. Uh, several examples here. Meals on Wheels. Uh, Kathy, uh, Lindy, and, and Sarah uh, helped me pursue this, this ministry, uh, and it was a great joy. I'm sorry it's over. The Hot Breakfast. I've enjoyed uh, working with Carrie on, on, on that ministry and, and hope we're going to be back soon. I love cooking for the church. Uh, English is a second language. I've replaced uh, Walter in assisting with registration. I see my role there as being large and male, and thus perhaps discouraging robbery. Um, <laughs> Freeminds book, book Club. 
I'm inspired by Alan's efforts uh, in, in that area. Uh, and uh, Appalachian Service Project, getting the youth of the church into doing good works is wonderful guidance. Uh, uh, thus far, my checkbook has been the star of these last couple uh, areas. But, but as they say, bring what you have to Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And batting cleanup, we have uh, Ivan Lowe. And we could have definitely used walk-up music because he's got a wa long walk here. So. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, really appreciate Walter's uh, ask. This was, I told him this morning this is, this is a challenge, um, but a really fun one. And I hope that after everybody hears what the four of us have to say today, that you also challenge yourself to uh, go home and think about what your calling is too. Uh, because I, I, one thing that I think will come out of that is you'll feel even more dedicated to that calling if you spend time, a little bit of time thinking about it. So thank you, Walter, for, for throwing this challenge down there. Um, I hope I can say that I'm living my calling if I think about the entirety of my adult life to date, I feel content with, with my, you know, what we would think of as your most important decisions, which I hope is a sign that I'm living my calling. Uh, to be honest, there are, are quite a lot of individual moments here and there where I'm probably failing to meet my calling, but that's not the topic of today. So the long game, though, has been a blessing, and I would describe myself as living my calling in expected and in unexpected ways. I work in government, in public service, at the State Department, just as my mom did at the IRS, and just as my dad, uh, her dad, my granddad did uh, with the Indian government. This has been the calling that I specifically sought out, the calling that I would say I expected it stems from a deep belief in the good that can come out of public service, which is clearly something I learned from my parents and grandparents and is something that they learned from their faith values. So the calling I sought out was one based on the idea that I want to try to contribute positively to the United States and to the world. However, thinking about this question, I would also say that I'm living my calling in a way that I did not originally expect, but have come to value as much as the line of work that I've chosen to do. I realized a number of years back that my calling was also to be a mentor, to develop and to champion my teammates and all of the various teams that I have worked on. To be honest, I did not seek out this calling, and it took a number of years before I even realized what it was and began to really own it. I can remember around 2015, which is at that point is uh, for today about halfway through where I am in my career, I received an email from a coworker leaving for maternity leave who was thanking me for the support I gave her in meetings when she shared her ideas. There was nothing extraordinary about what I had done. I simply publicly validated and amplified her ideas at a time when she was experiencing a fairly regular degree of dismissiveness from her teammates. And I tell you, I have forgotten about any of the kudos that I've received on my work these past 15 years, but it's emails like that and interactions with other coworkers that I remember very clearly. In the years since then, many of my colleagues have been willing to take the stresses and concerns they're facing in the job to me, and I have accepted the responsibility of being a good listener, mentor, advocate, and champion for the people that I work with. I also see this as a calling. I learned this about myself, I became convinced of it and I try to continue what I learn because I knew I learned this from my dad. I learned it from watching his career 
focused on pastoral ministry in the United Methodist Church. So this was the calling I didn't seek out, but I fully accept. I see this calling as one focused on strengthening the community around me through care and support to those around me. And maybe what I might think of as two different callings are really just two sides of the same coin, one that I expected and one that came unexpected. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's uh, give a hand again for the, the four of them. It takes a lot of effort and uh, their time. So. All right, please stand for the hymn called Revive Us Again. <laughs> 